ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining the Delaware Valley Vascular Society for our 2020 virtual meeting. This program will begin at 7 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining the Delaware Valley Vascular Society for our 2020 virtual meeting. This program will begin shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining the Delaware Valley Vascular Society for our 2020 virtual fall meeting. Our host for this evening is Dr. Faisal Aziz, Chief of the Division of Chief Vascular anything. Surgery at Penn State Heart and Vascular Institute. Dr. Aziz, the screen is yours. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming to our first ever virtual meeting. Uh, before we get started, a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, number one, at the bottom of your webinar window, you'll be able to see a chat button, uh, a raise hand button, and a Q&A button. For tonight's session, we'll only be using the Q&A button. So please make sure that if you have any questions, you write in that window. Um, number two, uh, as you know that, you know, with virtual format that we have, um, uh, today, there's not a whole lot of time for questions. So please be sure to type your questions in during the presentations. Uh, please do not wait until the presentations are over. I would also uh, ask all our presenters this evening to keep their cameras off and microphones muted until uh, we get to their get to their talk. Uh, 
uh, and I'm also uh, been tasked to uh, keep sessions on time. So I'll, uh, I'll politely ask all the presenters to be, please be aware of the time you have for your presentation. Uh, and uh, to kick off our session today, it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Gino Murley, who is our keynote speaker today. Uh, he, Dr. Murley, is a professor and senior vice president of Thomas Jefferson University and a co-director of the Jefferson Vascular Center in Philadelphia. Dr. Murley is a board certified specialist in internal medicine. He's professor of medicine and surgery and co-director of Jefferson Vascular Center. He's also the senior vice president and the associate chief medical officer at the Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. Dr. Murley received his medical degree from Jefferson and completed his residency and, um, and fellowship at Thomas Jefferson uh, University Hospital. Dr. Murley is a nationally recognized figure. He is an expert in the areas of prophylaxis for and management of DVT and PE, as well as for the medical consultation for surgical patients. His research focus has, has been largely on prophylaxis for DVT and PE and the management of DVT in medically ill patients, total joint replacement, trauma patients, and high-risk cancer patients. Dr. Murley also serves on the editorial board for Hospitalist News. He's the editor-in-chief of, of hospital practice. He's also a reviewer for the New England Journal of Medicines, Archives of Internal Medicine, Annals of Internal Medicine, Chest, Vascular Medicine, Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. And the list goes on and on. Uh, he's also the co-chair for Jefferson Mayo Clinic National Course on the perioperative care of the surgical patients with medical problems. In addition, doctors Murley and Weitz present at an innovative program called Consult Guys at the annual American College of Physicians meeting and monthly on the Annals of Internal Medicine website. Today, we're very, uh, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Murley among us, and he'll be talking uh, with us today about the effects of COVID-19 on vascular surgery. Dr. Murley. Dr. Aziz, thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to this great society, and I'm, I'm proud and honored to be here tonight. Uh, to present this uh, interesting topic that I think all of us have experienced in the last few months. Um, the, um, the, uh, I have no disclosures uh, to present for the group, uh, but I'd like to look at COVID-19 on all the effects of this uh, uh, pandemic infection. And uh, the ones that we're most concerned about are the thromboembolic, cardiac, of course, in the vascular areas. But you can see this disease does impact multiple organ systems. I, I think if we look at the disease in this pyramid uh, of uh, progression of disease, I can see, you can see at the top of the pyramid, uh, the COVID-19 death rate, you can see that this population as the disease progresses that most have the most severe outcomes are related to age, uh, immobility, the inflammatory response that occurs, and of course, all the hemostatic abnormalities, including DIC. So where does prophylaxis enter? Prophylaxis starts here with the patient entering into our system. And how are we going to approach this? So I think if we look at the disease, uh, I, I think this diagram pretty much outlines the focus of uh, the COVID infection. Uh, the <clears throat> virus of, attacks the ACE2 inhibitor uh, uh, receptor site on the cells, which are predominantly in the pulmonary system, but also in the GI tract, kidney, and, and vasculature as well. Once that direct cytotoxic effect occurs from the coronavirus, it then, de, you know, dysregulation occurs for the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And that sets off a whole cascade of events of tissue injury, inflammation, vasoconstriction, of course, and vascular permeability. And then the third aspect of this is the one we're most concerned about is that endothelial damage that occurs because of this, which increases fibrinolysis, uh, thrombin production, and of course, uh, thrombosis, both on the arterial and venous side. And then finally, there's the dysregulation that occurs to the immune system. And these patients often present with lymphopenia and cytokine storms with elevations in IL-6. 
and other uh, uh, inflammatory markers. So this is a nice diagram that is a composite of the disease and its impact. So now let's look at some studies to see if we can support this process. I think that's most important for us to think about. And this is a study, one of the first studies that came out of China. Uh, and this is 138 hospitalized COVID patients. And it looked at the median age and what were the most common symptoms. And we see this fatigue, dry cough, fatigue, and lymphopenia. And there was prolongation of the INR and elevations in LDH. When they looked at the different markers and outcomes, you can see that the non-survivors, the mortality, increased with elevations in D-dimers. And you see when it happened from day four onward, as the D-dimer elevations uh, continued upward, mortality also progressed in that same way. If you looked at renal function, since the ACE2 inhibitors are also present in the uh, renal endothelium, you can see also, once again, as renal failure progressed, patients had the high mortality. Next study that came out of China uh, by Zhao looked at 191 patients were included in this trial, 137 were discharged, 54 died in the hospital. And what were diseases, what comorbidities that we, of course, have seen with COVID-19, hypertension, diabetes, and patients with coronary artery disease, they had the highest mortality. Um, and, and so when you looked at this population and you pulled out those factors that I showed you in that initial diagram, you can see that elevations in D-dimers were a predictor of mortality in this group. IL-6, predictor of mortality. Troponins, and oftentimes patients presented appeared to have myocardial ischemia, which they did, uh, and mortality was high. And LDH, as you saw. So markers of inflammation uh, and thrombosis going on in the system, all indicators of high mortality. Lymphocytopenia was another predictor, as you saw in that initial study I showed you, and then serotonin ferritin levels, a marker of inflammation, were also elevated. Next study, also by Tang, showed 183 consecutive COVID-19 positive patients. This was a retrospective chart review, looking at survivors, and this is DIC. And I'm sure all of you on the, in this uh, group tonight have seen DIC in this population. Once DIC occurs, the mortality was 11.5% in this group. And this chart nicely pulls out age, prolongation of the pro-time, elevation in D-dimer, and fibrin de degradation products as, once again, other outcome parameters that predict mortality in this patient population of survivors. I think you have to look at also that the numbers are not very big. These are single cohort studies. Keep that in mind. This is not randomized trials of patients, but clearly showing predictors. So DIC, the other aspect that I brought to your attention, uh, this is the DIC criteria from the ISTH, and this is what they used in the trial, uh, in the study, the cohort study. And they use this to give you the prediction of DIC. I, I'm sure when you're looking at DIC, you put together the parameters. This is a nice way of looking at giving you a score that everyone has agreed upon in the International Society as a marker of DIC. So when you had DIC and COVID-19 infection, you obviously were pretty sick. 71.4% did not survive uh, in, in this patient group. Yin uh, looked at coagulation features in COVID-19 pneumonia, 99 patients uh, in this group. Now, this study, they actually put patients on prophylaxis. 94% uh, of the patients in this, 94 patients in this 99 group of patients that you saw received low molecular weight heparin. And the dosing was anywhere from 40 to 60 uh, milligrams per day. There was no specific dosing schedule. Five received unfractionated heparin, varying dosing from 10,000 to 15,000 units daily. Then there was the non-COVID group, 22, and they received low molecular weight heparin and two received unfractionated heparin. They were only treated for seven days with this dosing schedule. Everybody received antiviral therapy uh, at the time. 
So what did they look at? They looked at the non-heparin users uh, that were in red and the heparin users, uh, and that includes low molecular weight heparin and heparin. And clearly it shows the higher the D-dimer, the, uh, the higher the 28-day mortality in this group. So maybe prophylaxis does work. This was the first paper saying, well, maybe if we prophylax this population, maybe it will reduce mortality in the group. The non-COVID patient group who got prophylaxis, you saw that was a very small group. Once again, the non-heparin people, uh, those patients had a higher 28-day uh, mortality. Remember, these were non-COVID patients. Then uh, anticoagulation, once again, looking at decreasing uh, mortality in COVID infections. And this also came out of uh, China uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, as a single cohort study of 449 patients were severe COVID-19 positive out of a total of 1,700 cases. They were treated with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin for seven days. And what they showed is the patients who received unfractionated heparin had a lower mortality over 28 days. And looking at the D-dimers. And what they tried to use in this is they tried to use this severity score on this patient group uh, to show that if the D-dimers were elevated, as you know, the higher the D-dimer rate, the higher the mortality in this group. So the patients who did not get any prophylaxis you can see the mortality is very high. Well, no one would not prophylax a COVID-19 sick patient in the unit. The question is, what is the best prophylaxis? So this six score that I mentioned in the previous slide comes out of the ISTH uh, scoring system. And what it is is a sepsis-induced coagulopathy score. So they, we assume that COVID-19 stimulated a coagulopathy resulting in thrombosis decrease in fibrinolysis, and a DIC-type picture. And the SOFA score is a sequential organ failure assessment score that's used. So this is what they use to evaluate the patients in this trial. Now, Dr. Chu uh, did a prospective single-center cohort study of 81 patients with COVID-19. This patient study was very unique. Everyone got antiviral therapy but no preventive anticoagulant was administered to this patient group. So the patients did not get any prophylaxis whatsoever. So this is 81 patients. The incidence of lower extremity DVT, 25%, 20 out of 81 patients. And eight of the 20, 40% uh, the died, but we didn't know what the cause of death was. There was no autopsy in this study. But when you looked at the population, uh, the, the VTE group uh, and the non-VTE group, and you looked at what were the characteristics of those patients, once again, you saw age is a risk factor. So we all know that the older population had a much higher incidence of mortality. Secondly, once again, lymphopenia, you saw that that was part of the mechanism of action, uh, mechanism of of dysregulation that occurred with the immune system. And you saw also these patients, this case had a prolonged PTT uh, in this group, and then D-dimers, uh, elevated D-dimers. What they try to do, I thought was interesting in this study was, they try to use a cutoff of D-dimers to predict VTE. So they said, if your D-dimer was you know, 1,500, then your D-dimer, th th this indicated you were high incidence of VTE in that group, and they looked at sensitivity at that cutoff of 85% specificity and 88% negative predictive value. Sensitivity, 85%, specificity, 88%, and negative predictive value of 94.7%. So what they try to say was, hey, look, maybe you should do the D-dimer, and if the D-dimer is above 1,500, then those patients should be looked at for VTE. Of course, uh, no one bought into that at this point in time, but uh, I thought it was an interesting approach to the process. And then uh, Dr. Klock uh, in the Netherlands uh, decided to look at 184 ICU patients with proven COVID-19 pneumonia. 23 of the patients, 13% died. 22 were discharged alive. 
139, 76 were still in the ICU during this part of this study. The population, uh, as you can see, were, uh, you know, the age of 64, men predominantly, uh, mean body, uh, body mass index or body weight uh, uh, was 87. Uh, and uh, the active cancer group was very small. Coagulopathy during admission was high and anticoagulation therapeutic on admission. 17 patients got full anticoagulation on admission. Uh, and of course, uh, patients needed uh, hemodialysis on admission. So it was an interesting population that uh, uh, he looked at. But what I want you to see was the cumulative incidence of venous and arterial thrombotic events and complications that occurred in this population. So this is a single cohort study uh, of three hospitals. The, all the patients received uh, standard prophylaxis, and that varied between the hospitals, everyone getting low molecular weight heparin, but they all received prophylaxis. Prophylactic dosing. CTA and or ultrasound uh, for VTE, 27% of the patients uh, uh, had this, and PE was the most frequent thrombotic complication. Arterial events occurred in 3.7% of the patients. So when they followed them days in the ICU, you can see the longer you're in the ICU, uh, the higher the incidence became, cumulative incidence of, uh, of uh, venous and arterial thrombotic events, which you would expect. The patients were sicker, they weren't getting better, and that whole cascade of events was occurring that you saw in that initial diagram. Um, Middledorp, uh, uh, Saskia, uh, Saskia uh, Middledorp uh, looked at a single center uh, experience of 198 patients. 175 were admitted to the ICU. At day seven, 20%, 39 patients had VTE. 13%, 25 of this group, were symptomatic VTE. So 20% by day seven, 13% were symptomatic. The cumulative VT incidence at seven days was 16%, 14 days, 33%, and at 21 days, 42%. So it's very interesting. When you look at this population, they varied with respect to prophylaxis. They didn't know what was working best for this group, but clearly showing that the illness, the risk of thrombosis increases. That's why I think we have to look at not only the initial prophylaxis, but the extended prophylaxis in this group. The cumulative symptomatic VTE incidence on day seven was 10%, 21% of 14, and 25. This was symptomatic disease. So I, I think the, this study, uh, this single cohort study, uh, single center study, gives us more information on the duration of this disease. So I, I wanted you to see the detail that they did in this trial, and especially when you look at the legs, because that was the biggest thing that we faced uh, at Jefferson was the technologists going in because uh, many of the clinicians wanted to do serial ultrasounding on the patients who were in the intensive care unit, despite wearing compression sleeves and getting prophylaxis. And so you saw this is the DVT uh, numbers in this group, all patients, ICU patients versus ward patients. And you can see distal disease, proximal disease and distal disease, uh, and upper extremity DVT was small. But you can see that uh, proximal disease was, uh, was there in this population. And then PE, uh, in terms of symptomatic, uh, excuse me, symptomatic VTE, uh, 25 patients, 13% and 28%, looking at the ICU group and then the floor group. So, so the, the, the issue here is we know that this disease uh, uh, is significant, that thrombosis is a significant complication of COVID-19 infection. And this is the PE rate. Now, many of you have read papers from New York, uh, from Spain, from Italy, looking at the PE rates in this patient population and making a diagnosis on patients who are intubated on a ventilator, can't move down for a, a CT study, uh, but treating patients on the basis of high D-dimers and the, and the high probability of having pulmonary embolism based upon these kinds of studies. So cumulative VTE incidence, ICU versus the ward, 
which tells me I think we have to prophylax aggressively and for a longer period of time. Now, the other aspect is, is the incidence of asymptomatic disease in patients with COVID-19 and elevated D-dimers. Uh, this is a population that uh, uh, Demelo Rodriguez looked at and they uh, um, looked at, and that the populations are small. I want you to look at the number here, 14.7% and proximal disease, but distal disease is fairly common. The posterior tibial vein, uh, a popliteal vein, uh, you know, uh, thrombosis, uh, perineal vein thrombosis in this group, and even bilateral disease was fairly frequent. But it doesn't say anything about how these patients were prophylaxed. It just shows you that the disease uh, is, 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 is prevalent. And this is a study of 1,400 admissions with COVID-19, and this is systemic arterial thrombotic events. So this is the other side of the circulation. Three patients had acute coronary syndrome, eight patients had cerebrovascular events, and three limb ischemia, infrapopliteal area. And the hospitalized death rate in patients with arterial events was 28%, really very high. So remember, what population was high risk? Patients with coronary artery disease, age patients, diabetic patients, hypertensive patients, a high risk group, uh, uh, I, I think you have to keep in mind. And you can see that arterial side thrombosis is significant. And Yan, uh, Zhang, Zhang Yan uh, did this study of seven critically ill COVID-19 patients with acro ischemia. And uh, all these patients had presentation with finger and toe cyanosis, skin bullae, dry gangrene, all had D-dimers markedly elevated, all you saw this per, er, earlier. Prothrombin time was prolonged and four patients were diagnosed with DIC. When you looked at this population, these are the six patients uh, that uh, they showed some aspects of their digits. Uh, they all received full dose low molecular weight heparin. Uh, and the D-dimers uh, decreased as well as the fibrin degradation products but there was no improvement, uh, no significant clinical improvement once the patient reached this point, and mortality was very high. So if we summarize this, what did we see in COVID-19 based upon the manifestations, pathophysiology of disease? We saw that there was a coagulopathy with elevated fibrinogen uh, uh, D-dimers, sometimes prolonged PT, PTTs, and platelet counts uh, you know, uh, in this population uh, sometimes were elevated, but decreased eventually in, in, the case, in this case, and the early stages of the infection. IL-6 levels were correlated with uh, increasing fibrinogen levels, which increased risk for thrombosis. Coagulopathy appears to be related to the severity of illness and resultant of thromboinflammatory and, of course, non-intrinsic viral activity. Elevated D-dimers at admission clearly showed more high mortality. So if your D-dimers were in the thousands, your mortality was very, very high. And a rising D-dimer after admissions preceded further multi-organ failure. So once you developed renal failure, DIC picture, then the mortality in that patient was extremely high. And the longer you're in the hospital, you saw the greater your risk for developing thrombosis. And bleeding manifestations were not uh, common despite the coagulopathy. So how could we approach this? So let's, let's summarize what we try to do from what we learned from these trials. So we decided as a group, and I, I mean, this was an entire health system uh, that was part of a working committee uh, from a variety of disciplines. Um, what we did, we said, if you're in the ICU and your platelet count was greater than 25,000 and your creatinine clearance was greater than 30 cc's, we said you needed compression sleeves plus anoxaparin, but we would give anoxaparin based upon the weight of the patient. Because some patients, as you know, were obese, therefore giving standard dosing in the bariatric literature showed was not effective. So we said, if you're less than 40 kilos, you got 30 milligrams. If you're 40 to 120, you got 40 milligrams. This is 30, 40. And if you're greater than 120 kilos, you got 40 Q12. We felt we needed 
to give the appropriate dose of prophylaxis. Now we chose this because we didn't find a trial that said this is how they did it. We chose this on the most likely clinical approach in the therapeutic process that we looked at in this patient group. If your creatinine clearance was less than 30 C's, CCs, which frequently was, remember if you had an older population, then we used unfractionated heparin. And we also dosed this by kilogram weight. And you can see the dosing schedule we use, Q12, Q8, and 7,500 Q8 hours. So this is how we approach prophylaxis once you hit the unit at Jefferson. We did not do serial ultrasounds. The only time we did an ultrasound if the patient was symptomatic, uh, we, did not do, we did not do screening on admission, and only if you were symptomatic did we do an ultrasound of the extremity. We then said, what do you do if you make it through the unit and you get out to the floor? Then what happens? Uh, we have the following uh, occur. So we use, once again, the platelet count, the creatinine clearance. But in this case, we have the option of an oxaparin 40 milligrams and then change by weight. But we introduced rivaroxaban as one of the management strategies based upon the Mariner trial that uh, looked at 10 milligrams of anoxaparin in the medically ill hospitalized patients with elevated D-dimers on admission, not in the thousand range, um, but elevated D-dimers showed that this was an effective agent. So we did this as part of our management for this, depending upon the patient and their wish to use an injectable agent. Once again, we still stayed with the same dosing of unfractionated heparin. And, and finally, I, I would like to say how we treated those patients who were actually discharged from the hospital with COVID-19 infection. So I'm gonna give you one, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the improved and the improved bleeding risk scores in a second, but I wanna tell you, this is what we used as a decision-making tool at the time of discharge. We wanted to see what the risk of VTE was at discharge and what the bleeding risk was to decide what to send the patient home on. And we based this on the scoring system. So you can see if your creatinine clearance was greater than 30 cc's and you were a high VTE risk and a low bleeding risk, you could get an oxaparin 40 a day. We had the dose for less than 40, greater than 40. We kept it at once a day dosing for appropriate patient use. And if the LFTs were okay, we also recommended rivaroxaban since this was studied in that Mariner trial in the medically ill to go home on. If you were a high VT risk, but your bleeding risk was very high, then in those patients, what we did is we used compression sleeves for home, knee high, assessment for VT signs and symptoms, and we encouraged ambulation. And as of, uh, as of April, we said most patients with COVID-19 were moderate to high risk, so they should all be assessed and considered for home prophylaxis. So here's the scoring system we used. I would recommend you use this. This has been validated in the improved registry, which uh, we were part of at Jefferson. And in this improved registry, uh, uh, it, showed you, it showed us that this was a good predictor of who was at risk for VTE. And this scoring uh, showed the risk of bleeding. I think these were very helpful. There's the references I put in there for the group. And finally, as I wrap this up for the group, uh, uh, this is a, a very nice paper that was put together by our working group. Uh, Paul DiMuzio was part of this process uh, with us. Uh, and this paper was published by Ryan Watson, one of our fellows in cardiology and Drew Johnson. Uh, and this is a great review uh, based upon our health system on patients with arterial and venous uh, risk with COVID-19. And this paper, which will be uh, published, it's published ahead of print. This is uh, recommendations. It's a position paper by the PERT organization on pulmonary embolism management in, uh, in patients with COVID-19. And then to bring this to a final close, we decided we're gonna to need to follow our patients and look at the outcome. And the first trial, uh, first registry is our Corona VTE registry, uh, which we're collecting 3000 patients, both retrospective and prospectively with the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And this is an adjudicated registry. 
uh, which is uh, very aggressive in assessing the outcomes. So this will be a very, very good seminal publication once it gets done. And then we have the photo 19 registry, which is the post-hospital discharge registry, where we'll be looking at 1,200 COVID-19 patients discharged from Jefferson. Uh, and we'll be looking at what prophylaxis they received. Did they have recurrent VTE? Did they die? Uh, did they get recurrent COVID infection? And finally, the freedom study, which will begin soon, which is a prospective study comparing enoxaparin 40 a day against enoxaparin one milligram per kilogram Q12 versus a pixaban five milligrams Q12. So this is a randomized prospective trial uh, looking at non-ICU COVID-19 patients. So what we're trying to do is see how we're, how we're doing, how we follow the protocols we put together. And I know you'll have a, a number of questions about this as we close here. So any questions for me, you could send to my email or if you want the set of my slides, they're available for you. Uh, and I have additional slides on our guidance that we do have. Uh, so I'll stop at that point and uh, be available here now for question and answer from the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Marley, thank you so much for, for such a, a powerful talk. Uh, truly appreciate it. Uh, while we're waiting for audience questions, let me ask you a few questions. Uh, so I guess my first question is, uh, you know, as you mentioned, it is so important for, for adequate VTE prophylaxis for this cohort of patients with COVID-19. Uh, I guess my question is, is there evidence to suggest or there are, is there any guidelines to suggest to, to, to consider therapeutic anticoagulation for patients who have, uh, have a diagnosis of COVID-19 and who are, who are sick um, in ICU, and we know they're at high risk of uh, VTE complications. So Dr. Aziz, uh, that's uh, uh, definitely appropriate because I think a number of small papers, uh, single uh, groups, you know, single 10, 15 patients that were treated with full therapeutic anticoagulation appear to do well. Uh, and so that's why the, this freedom trial that uh, you just saw uh, was uh, put together uh, from the people from Mount Sinai in New York uh, and uh, 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 Valentin Fuster, uh, whose group was using full therapeutic anticoagulation. In fact, they also had a paper with thrombolysis uh, in patients they suspected with pulmonary embolism. So he felt that we had to actually study full dose anticoagulation versus prophylactic versus an oral DOAC, which uh, I thought was very interesting. So you're absolutely right. I, I think there are papers that the clinician feels that there's such, the only way to explain everything that's going on is full thrombotic events occurring in the pulmonary vasculature uh, and therefore full treatment uh, needs to be initiated. So we've seen that. And of course, uh, anecdotally, we've seen that patients hemoglobins drop and, and you get a little worried, but just think the patients are really sick. The hemoglobin might be dropping for other reasons besides bleeding from anticoagulation. So I think your point is this, once it happens and D-dimers are in the 15,000 range and you're in DIC, uh, I, I think that's, that's why I think treating them full dose leads us to that. And that's why we need to study it. Sounds good. I have two more questions for you from our audience. So first is from Dr. Paul DiMuzio, whom you know very well. Uh, and Dr. DiMuzio is asking, how are, you, how are you preparing for, this, for the new surge of COVID uh, or even possibly with worst outcomes? So how are we, uh, so as an enterprise, um, we've mobilized uh, our ICU group and the hospitalist groups across the enterprise. There's 14 hospitals. So uh, I oversee all the hospitalists uh, uh, in the enterprise. Uh, uh, and um, so we're geared up now ready to begin if a surge should happen and to cohort those patients at each of the hospitals we have. So at the main hospital, Jefferson, uh, I used the nine Thompson and nine, uh, 10 Thompson area, which I have 35 beds. They are totally dedicated to COVID-19 patients. We must cohort those patients away from the main base of patients to reduce the risk of COVID spread, of course, to that population. Um, similarly, at our hospitals that have higher risk, such as uh, the uh, our area, ARIA Health System up in the Northeast, uh, 
where there's a larger number of long-term care facilities. But thank goodness the care facilities are doing much better on PPE prophylaxis for their PPE for their patients and their healthcare providers. So I think we're geared up should this uh, uh, spike occur in COVID-19. We're ready to deal with it. Sounds good. Our second question is from Dr. Jose Trani, who is also the president of our society. And he's asking, and I quote, uh, he says, Dr. Murley, based on, based on the evidence that you have reviewed with us in the context of COVID-19 uh, system, uh, systematic, uh, systemic process, what role do you feel thrombotic or embolic contributions were, to, uh, were, were due to patients' overall morbidity and mortality? And in fact, uh, did this have a small impact on the overall outcome of these patients or, or did a thrombotic event dramatically worsen the overall uh, prognosis for these patients? Uh, he, he goes on and he asks, was an arterial event worse than a venous event? And he's thanking so, for your wonderful. Yes. So I think um, once you develop the, the thrombotic complications of the disease, I think that hastened the mortality of the patients. So I, I think that, that, that I think clearly that's what I, I believe occurred as the disease progresses. I think the arterial complications were more devastating, specifically MI, stroke, and peripheral ischemia, and maybe doctor, maybe people on this call, uh, the surgeons out there probably have experienced this already uh, in the population they have. I think once, you've, uh, once you have stimulated the arterial side of the system, and remember, those patients had higher comorbidities going into it. So if you already had PAD, you might be at greater risk for an arterial thrombotic event. I think once that happened and you had an ischemic limb, we all know that uh, that, that, it, that would hasten the prognosis and mortality in that patient group. So I think he's absolutely right. I think once the thrombotic system hit in full gear, I think it increased the, the risk in the population. Now remember, we're throwing better management in now. We've added antiviral therapy to the process. So everyone comes in, gets treated a little more aggressively since we know much better about antiviral, like remdesivir, uh, use in this population. So, um, I, you know, I, I think this is a very devastating disease once the full-blown event occurs uh, and you d dysregulate your immune and your RAS system. Once that happens and you get cytokine storm, I think, um, and thrombosis occurs, I think the mortality is high. Sounds good. Thank you so much once again for, for sharing your knowledge and, and wisdom with us on this topic. Thank uh, you. Uh, we'll move on to a rapid fire uh, session. Uh, the next session is a rapid fire session. Before I introduce our first presenter, I would like to uh, let all our attendees know that, uh, that you know, in, in in-person events that we normally hold every year, we would have handed you score sheets to let you vote on your favorite presentations. However, uh, due to virtual nature of these presentations, I uh, will ask everyone to vote online for your top two highest rated papers. You will be able to vote twice. Dr. Aziz, what we'll do now is uh, do a test poll just to vote on their top favorite movies. So if everyone could please take out their phones and text SBS online to the number 22333, we'll be able to watch the results. So to clarify, each each person can vote twice, right? The first will be towards the first choice, the second will towards the number two choice. Is that correct? That is correct. So at the end of all of the uh, rapid fire presentations, we will hold the real vote. This uh, test vote will just make it easier for people to vote later because they've already joined. Sounds good. Already, should we start?
Yes, ready to begin. Alrighty, uh, just a reminder. So all rapid fire presenters will have three minutes for their presentations and two minutes for question and answers. To start off, the first presenter of today uh, is Dr. James Butts. He'll be presenting on the topic of thoracic abdominal aortic aneurysm repair <coughs> in patients with chronic type B aortic dissection versus atherosclerotic disease. Dr. Butts. Hi, thank you. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you. If you can just uh, click on the title slide. There you go. Great. Thank you to Dr. Murley for that very interesting talk and thank you to the Society for accepting this abstract for presentation. My name is James Butts. I'll be presenting a comparative study of outcomes in open thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm repair in patients with chronic type B aortic dissections uh, versus atherosclerotic aneurysms. The two most common etiologies for thoracoabdominal aneurysms are chronic type B aortic dissections and atherosclerotic aneurysms. The purpose of our study was to elicit if a difference in outcome existed based on the etiology of those aneurysms. We performed a retrospective review of 220 patients who underwent an open thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm repair between the years of 1999 and 2017. There were significant differences in age between cohorts with an average of 57 in the dissections group and 69 in the atherosclerotics. There were also differences in gender with a male predominance in the chronic dissection group. Um, connective tissue disorders, specifically Marfan's disease in the dissection group, and COPD within the atherosclerotic group. There were no differences in hypertension, preoperative stroke, CKD, or dialysis dependence. We found differences in previous aortic procedures um, each patient had as well. Patients in the chronic dissection cohort had significantly more ascending aorta replacements at 36% compared to 9%. Um, and elephant trunk subtype 1 at 17% compared to 3.5%. The chronic dissection cohort were predominantly type 1 and descending or type 5 exit subtype classifications under the Crossford um, description of thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysms. The atherosclerotic cohort had uh, more type 2 extant thoracoabdominals than the dissection group. However, it was the least common group overall in that cohort. There were no differences with regard to in-house mortality and 30-day mortality, paraplegia, stroke, acute kidney injury, or reoperation for bleeding between either cohort. There were also no differences in the number of ICU days, time to liberation from the ventilator, or reintubation between either cohort. However, there were a significant difference in long-term mortality of each of these cohorts. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve illustrating the overall survival of each cohort of patients. As you can see, the chronic type B aortic dissection group had a much improved survival at every interval. At one year, the overall survival of chronic dissections was 92% as opposed to 76% in the atherosclerotic cohort. At five years of follow-up, the 79% of the chronic dissection group was still alive compared to the 63% of the atherosclerotic group. And then at 10 years, more than half of the atherosclerotic group had died compared to the chronic dissection group. Chronic type B aortic dissection patients are different from atherosclerotic patients. There were no differences in operative mortality or paraplegia or stroke. The chronic type B aortic dissection patients do have a significantly better long-term survival um, advantage. And that may relay to um, better outcomes in open repair for the younger chronic type B aortic dissection cohort of patients. We have to take any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Butts. Uh, so, uh, we, while we wait for the audience to ask questions, uh, question for you, in terms of operative ana uh, an, um, anatomy, for chronic type B dissections, as you know, when we operate, the septum is thickened and the blood uh, and the aortic blood, uh, aortic wall uh, does not act like normal aortic wall. Is there any technical uh, differences you notice in terms of operative times uh, or uh, anastomotic complications between these two cohorts? That's an excellent question. There actually were a reduction in the um, operative times 
specifically cross clamp times and um, times on hypothermic circulatory arrest uh, favoring the chronic type B aortic dissection group as opposed to the atherosclerotic group. And then um, to your second point, uh, I'm sorry, what was the second part? Any anastomotic complications uh, between these two groups? Uh, none that were observed or um, described within the study. Sounds good. If we don't have any further questions, I think we'll keep marching along. Thank you once, uh, once again, Dr. Weiss. Dr. Butts. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Robert Weiss. Um, Dr. Robert Weiss will be presenting on the topic of pulse-style abdominal mass with normal aorta. Dr. Weiss. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aziz. Uh, uh, is everybody able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, so uh, thank you again, Dr. Aziz, for the introduction. Um, I'll be presenting today on uh, pulse-style abdominal mass with normal aorta. Um, so this is a case presentation of a 40-year-old female who initially presented to the emergency department with uh, epigastric abdominal pain that was associated, associated with the pulsatile abdominal mass. Um, the remainder of her physical exam was without any abnormality. She did have a past medical history of hypertension and obesity, um, but no past surgical Dr. Weiss, you've uh, <laughs> gone very quiet. You there? Now we can hear you, yes. All right. So uh, while she was in the emergency department, a CT of the abdomen and pelvis was performed, um, which shows the following images. Um, so as you can see here, there's a large uh, aneurysm of the common hepatic artery um, that was measuring from 6.5 uh, 6 by 6.5 centimeters. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the axial images. On the right, you can see the coronals. Um, 3D reconstruction imaging is shown here, um, which also just shows the large size of this common hepatic artery aneurysm. Um, so uh, we decided to obviously admit this patient to the hospital. She was initially admitted to the ICU for uh, blood pressure control and was taken urgently to the operating room the following day for open repair of the common hepatic artery aneurysm. Um, we chose open repair because we didn't feel that there was adequate uh, distal landing zones for a covered stem placement. So we uh, started our procedure with a midline laparotomy, and then we got proximal control of the celiac artery. Left gastric artery and splenic arteries had to be ligated um, in order to further mobilize the celiac artery and allow for adequate exposure and control. Uh, epiploic arteries were carefully preserved during this uh, part of the procedure to make sure that the stomach maintained its uh, vascular uh, supply and uh, no ischemic complications were seen. The aneurysm sac was open and it was reconstructed using a saphenous vein graft um, extending from the celiac artery to the common origin of the proper hepatic and the uh, gastroduodenal artery. The aneurysm sac was enclosed over the graft uh, and a prophylactic cholecystectomy was performed uh, in, the, in the case of ischemic cholecystitis. Uh, for intraoperative imaging, you can see here uh, the reverse, you can see the saphenous vein graft inside the aneurysm sac itself. You can also see some of the mural thymus present. Uh, Postoperatively, she was uh, she had some elevation in her hepatic transaminases, uh, but they quickly resolved. Uh, she was admitted aspirin for antiplatelet therapy, and ultimately was discharged home on the sixth postoperative day with improvement in her symptoms, and uh, she was back to normal activity. At six month follow up, uh, the patient remained with normal activity and did not have any abdominal pain. Um, for so recommendations for hepatic artery aneurysm. In general, uh, so hepatic artery aneurysms have an incidence of 0.002% in the population. Uh, risk factors are not exactly clear, but they're mostly associated with uh, connective tissue disorders and, and vasculitis, such as fibromuscular dysplasia, tachycardia, arteritis, vasculitis, Wegener gramatosis, and other connective tissue disorders. Uh, for repair, uh, for all visceral aneurysms are recommended for greater than two centimeters if they're symptomatic or if they're ruptured. You can do endovascular repair with, uh, with uh, for these aneurysms and also obviously open is viable as well. We always try to maintain the hepatic circulation when it's possible. However, ligation is, is an option if uh, there's presence of adequate collaterals. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing your very interesting case. We do have a question from audience, and the question is, why did you use saphenous vein over a prosthetic graft? Uh, we, can, we, considered, uh, we considered using a prosthetic graft at the time, um, but the aneurysm was very, very close to the 
pancreas. Um, and we actually had to mobilize the aneurysm itself off the pancreas, and it was concerned by putting a prosthetic graft in that area that it would uh, lead to further complications down the line, and we felt that the native tissue would be better. Also, with the saphenous vein, it was really good uh, size match, so we, we felt it was an, an adequate conduit to use. Uh, sounds good. Um, uh, have you considered uh, submitting it to um, to JVS? I think the pictures are interesting enough. Uh, we did, and it's currently under review. That's great. Thank you so much for uh, once again for sharing your case with us. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll keep moving along. Our next presenter is, Dr., uh, is Marvin Chow, who is a medical student. Um, Marvin will be talking about from a case of a traumatic non-anastomotic pseudoaneurysm rupture of uh, PTFE FEMPOP bypass. I'm sorry, FEM, FEM bypass. Marvin. Stand by Dr. Chow, I'm just trying to give you control. Okay should be able to click on your title slide. Alrighty. Thank you for the opportunity to present. So today I'll talk about traumatic, uh, non-anastomotic uh, PSA rupture in a fem, uh, PTFP FEMFEM bypass graph. Alrighty. So this is a case report, a little bit about the patient, 75 year old male, status post left to right FEMFEM bypass graph with PTFP about 10 years ago. He was seen in clinic, past surgical history, as indicated, the bypass and simultaneously uh, right SFA stenting. Past medical history, as indicated, with hypertension, type 2 diabetes, uh, CKD, COPD, and myasthenia gravis on chronic corticosteroids and PAD. So he presented after falling one week prior in the bathroom, and his impact was in the right lower abdomen, um, striking the edge of the bathtub. So an arterial duplex was uh, performed. And as we can see here, the arterial duplex showed an active blood uh, flow measuring about two, to, two by 2.5 centimeters adjacent to the distal limb of the right of the bypass graph, consistent with a PSA. A CT was also done um, after the patient was admitted to the hospital. So the patient on physical exam, they pre, uh, presented with a firm, tender area of non -swell or swelling that was noted in the right lower abdomen with overlying ecchymosis. He, the, he was hemodynamically stable. He was afebrile um, without leukocytosis. Playing CT. So as we can see, our area of interest We see here that the patient has a, um, a highly attenuated area, lobular structure, um, consistent with the PSA and a graft disruption. There was no fluid collections around the anastomotic sites. So the patient ended up being admitted to the vascular surgery service and Empiric antibiotics were started, as well as taken to the operated room, like in the morning. So there was incisions were made bilaterally. It was well incorporated with no signs of infection or fluid. The old bypass anastomosis was taken down. We used a six millimeter ring PTFE for a new femfem bypass, and this was tunneled subcutaneously away from the PSA in the right lower abdomen, and end side anastomosis to the previous arteriotomies with fibroproline was done. The PSA was exposed through the transverse incision over the anterior lower right abdomen. It was debrided um, in the subcutaneous tissue and irrigated with an antibiotic solution. Um, and a wound vac was placed for secondary healing. As we can see here, there's, this is the PSA capsule in the cavity right here. Postoperatively, the patient tolerated the procedure well. It's uncomplicated. One of the three interop PSA cultures grew Staph aureus, uh, Staphylococcus epidermis, which was then treated with appropriate antibiotics. Patient was discharged post-op day six and seen in the clinic two months later. The wounds were healed. 
duplex ultrasound showed a patent femfem bypass graft with no evidence of stenosis or new PSA. So we thought this was a unique case in a non-anastomotic PSA and graft disruption in a 10-year-old uh, PTAP femfem bypass graft after a traumatic fall. And this highlights salient issues of the importance of surveillance since the patient did not see a provider in 10 years. The exact shelf life of PTFEs are not exactly known. And the positive culture for Staphylococcus epi epidermis um, was also another issue. So concluding, we thought that FEMFEM bypass grafts are susceptible to PSA degeneration in non-anastomotic regions after trauma and should undergo surveillance if such events are reported. Some references. And thank you for the opportunity and I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Marvin, for sharing an interesting case. We do have a question from audience. And, uh, and the question is, uh, did you consider XFEM instead of redo FEMFEM bypass? So that, for, that, for our patient, um, potentially, um, we had to reevaluate the patient's anatomy in order to consider the XFEM. But at the time, we thought that appropriately redoing something that has been stable for 10 years already could give the patient a little bit more longevity, so. Got it. Other question for you. Do you think it was truly traumatic or do you think it was, it was in the hindsight, it was an anastomotic infected pseudoaneurysm which just got more pronounced because of a trauma? So that's one of the reasons why we thought to get the CT was to evaluate if there was any like fluid collections or anything that could signify like any type of infection. So we thought that since that was not the case um, and the intraop cultures that showed PSA, um, you know, with the staph staphylococcus epidermi epidermitis, it could have been like a contaminated or false positive as well, since that's on our skin flora. Got it. So we got two comments from audience. Uh, uh, one is from Dr. Demosia, who wrote that we had a similar issue in a patient with MAT bypass uh, with Miller Cuff, who was in a bicycle accident. It was not infected and paid in three years later. I never heard of this again until your presentation tonight. Nice presentation. Good job. Thank you. Um, another question uh, is, was there any consideration given to a treatment with a stent graft to exclude the pseudoaneurysm rather than explanting it? So in our situation, I, we thought that explanting it was the safest method to get uh, gain visualization of what might be going on in the patient's body. So in that situation, we thought that explanting it and redoing something again, more sustainable would have been the best operative uh, choice, especially since the patient is 75 years old. We thought, you know, we wanted something uh, long, a little bit more sustainable and again, avoiding re-intervention later on. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Yep. Uh, moving on, our next presenter is Dr. Marvin Marcelin, uh, who will be talking about wins, losses, and long-term trends in amputations in the Delaware Valley Abington Hospital. Dr. Marcelin. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Stand by for control of your slides. Okay. You are all set. All right. There is a descending trend in major amputations for both the western part of the Pennsylvania and the Delaware Valley. These trends mirror national data from the National Inpatient Sample Database. There is an increase in major amputations starting in 2014. This may be a coding issue due to the lack of revision codes from ICD-9 up to ICD-10. Repair codes are available but not often used. Uh, the Delaware Valley recorded over 100 revision stump codes uh, per year in the ICD-9 terminology. This graph demonstrates a descending trend in major amputation rates per 100,000 people from 2005 until 2012. Then there's a dramatic increase in rates in the western part of the state surpassing the gradual rise in the Delaware Valley the overall major amputation rate in the US is estimated to be about 22 per 100,000 people. 
This graph depicts the gender disparity in major amputations. This disparity started in the late 1990s and grew wider more recently. And once again, we're looking at the Western part of the state. Now moving on to the Delaware Valley, uh, again, there's still gender disparity. And as you can see, the pattern is very similar to the previous slide in which we were looking at the Western part of the state. Overall, this disparity is growing wider over time. This slide depicts the number of admissions for diabetic foot infections and critical limb ischemia from 2010 to 2018 for the residents of the Delaware Valley. Philadelphia is the top, uh, the blue line. And the higher the number of admissions reflects a larger population as well as a higher prevalence of diabetes. The prevalence of diabetes in Philadelphia is 16%, where the suburban counties are about 10%. There is a gradual increase in admissions over time in each county. The average rate of major non-traumatic amputation by race in the Delaware Valley mirrors national data. Black patients and Hispanics have a higher rate of major amputations in comparison to white or Asian patients. Black males have the highest rate of major amputations and white females are the lowest. The rate is per 100,000 uh, people in the population. And this is given by uh, yearly census estimates. Interestingly, the most progress in preventing major amputations takes place in the, the age group of 80 plus in years. So overall, these are the wins, the losses, and the trends. There is a mild decrease of major amputations. Overall, major amputation rate in the Delaware Valley is lower than that of the western part of the state. Racial disparity continues to persist. However, females are suffering less amputations. The trend in major amputations is suffered by men, and this is increasing. And the Delaware Valley trends in amputations mirror national trends. And that's my presentation. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Marcelin, for this wonderful presentation. In fact, our group just published not too long ago the data about disparity in, in healthcare for peripheral arterial disease uh, for uh, different um, uh, different races. My question to you is: clearly, there's a different there's a gap, right, between uh, between different races. Did you also look into factors contributing towards that? That is to say. Was there a delayed presentation or was there a, a delay in revascularization or uh, a less attempts at revascularization? Um, um, was a socioeconomic status associated with that? Uh, it's intriguing. We just published in a similar topic, so I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. Yeah, so for this particular um, study, we didn't go into detail in regards to why these things were happening. What we basically went into look at is okay what are the trends let's throw this information out there and collectively as a group perhaps we can come together and figure out what's going on and um, as a podiatrist we definitely rely on the vascular surgeons because you see that you guys do fantastic work and once we get uh, reperfusion to you know the lower extremities we see great changes and perhaps there is more to that story and it's just one of those things that uh, we believe that we need to look more into it, but no, I didn't look specifically into what's going on and why it's happening. Uh, no, great presentation. I think maybe we need to join forces uh, to figure out because we certainly have data about the vascular surgery outcomes um, and the and the racial disparities between the outcomes. Uh, and you certainly have the that cohort of patients which end up with major amputations. Um, um, so I think you know. Um, uh, that is the future. I think we, we can join forces.
uh, just got a message from Dr. Uh, Trani, uh, Dr. Jose Trani, who is our president. And um, his question is, when looking at the race uh, and ethnicity per 100,000 rates uh, utilized per 100,000 in each race ethnicity or overall population? In each race. So this is uh, in each race. In each race. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I think we should join forces. Uh, but thank you. Uh, great presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, moving on, our next presenter for tonight is Dr. Kunal Wani, who will be talking uh, on the topic of evolving management of pancreatic duodenal aneurysms, a case series. Uh, Dr. Wani. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. Do I have control of the slides? Yes, if you just click on the title slide. Okay, great. There you go. Hi, uh, I'm Kunal Vani. I'll be presenting on uh, behalf of Pennsylvania Hospital. I'll be presenting management of pancreatic duodenal aneurysms. This is a single institution experience. PDAs, as we know, are rare visceral aneurysms. They have a high likelihood for rupture. We recommend open or endovascular re intervention for these highly aggressive lesions. We retrospectively reviewed seven cases from Pennsylvania Hospital since 1992. We performed treatment of these aneurysms from an open and endovascular standpoint. The purpose of this presentation is to discuss the management of these highly aggressive lesions. Our first case is a 43-year-old female. She had abdominal pain, uh, secondary to median arcuate ligament syndrome. Uh, she had, uh, uh, on her CTA, she had an occluded celiac origin, um, and she had undergone previous robotic lysis of her median arcuate ligament. Um, when we had seen her, she, her celiac artery was occluded. She had two PDAs, uh, one 13 millimeters, the other 17 millimeters, coming off of the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery. For this patient, we did not feel that she was an endovascular candidate. Uh, we felt that due to her celiac artery occlusion and uh, her high risk for hepatic ischemia due to poor collateral circulation from her GDA, we felt that she would best be served by an open surgical ligation of her PDA and revascularization by aortopatic artery bypass. Uh, the patient did well four years with follow-up and remains to have an open bypass graft. Our second case is a 58-year-old male who presented with abdominal pain for several months. He was found to have a 6.8 centimeter PDA. Uh, he, on his CTA, had a celiac artery stenosis, and as you can see, he has a partially thrombosed PDA, 6.8 centimeters. And it's coming off of the uh, inferior PD artery just at the takeoff of that SMA. We felt that this patient was a good uh, endovascular candidate uh, via repair uh, via an endovascular SMA stent graft and placement of coils in that PDA. Uh, on follow-up CTA, you can see that the SMA stent graft is widely patent. You can also see that the PDA is successfully thrombosed in the situation. And 12 years in follow-up, this patient remains to have a widely patent SMA stent graft and continues to do well. Our third case is a 64-year-old female presented with a ruptured PDA. Her CTA shows an occluded celiac artery origin. You can see focal extravasation from the PDA. Uh, you also see a large intraperitoneal hematoma. This patient was initially stable. We felt that endovascular uh, intervention would be the best option for this patient as she was stable. However, we could not cross the celiac artery occlusion. Uh, and we felt that it was unsafe to coil off uh, the PDA due to her poor collateral circulation by the GDA. Um, the patient did become unstable. We performed an open ligation of her PDA, and we were able to preserve that GDA. Um, and she continues to do well in follow-up. Uh, we did not feel that she was a candidate for revascularization uh, because of her instability, and she, she did well despite this. So in summary, uh, in our case series uh, of seven patients, uh, four of these patients underwent open ligation of their PDAs. Two of these patients underwent revascularization by aortohepatic bypass. Three of the patients underwent PDA coiling, um, and two of the patients underwent SMA stent graft exclusion. So you can see that there's a wide variety of treatment options for these highly aggressive lesions. In conclusion, uh, in our study, we found that 57% of patients had celiac artery occlusion or stenosis, which was consistent with the literature review of about 64% of uh, celiac artery stenosis found in PDA cases. We feel at our institution that endovascular intervention should be considered the first line option when possible. We also feel that selective revascularization should be performed uh, with a bypass or a stent graft in patients that are at high risk for hepatic ischemia in the setting of a poor, uh, in the setting of a poor 
collateral circulation via their GDA. Thank you for this presentation. Thank you. Uh, interesting presentation. Um, uh, can I ask you, are you a resident? I'm a uh, fellow. Okay, you're a fellow. Okay, even better. Question for you. So when we put the via bonds across, uh, across you know, the, the origin of these aneurysms, one of the one of the things which is which is limiting is is the is the angulation, uh, especially at the celiac takeoff. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, I think you know, third, twelve years out, this uh, stent graft variant is just amazing. Uh, in your review, did you find any correlation between the angulation uh, of the stent graft itself and its impact on its on its um, um, uh, patency? We didn't feel like there was a real uh, significance with the angulation, to be honest. We felt that as long as there was a good landing zone, both proximally and distally, and that the, the takeoff of the PDA uh, was very near the origin of the SMA, we felt that it was able to be coiled without the, without the propensity for an endo leak. And if there were uh, outflow uh, vessels, we uh, felt that coiling those would be appropriate if uh, they were able to be accessed as well. Sounds good. No, thank you so much. Interesting case, interesting case series. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Uh, moving on, uh, our next presentation, uh, presenter is Dr. Lindsay Lynch, who will be talking about percutaneous endovascular management of type B dissection in the setting of malperfusion. Dr. Lynch. Thank you, Dr. Aziz, and thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. Stand by, Dr. Lynch. I'm just trying to get the control feature to work for you. Okay, here we go. Just click on that title slide. Let me try using the mouse to click to advance or your arrow key. It did this last night too, it takes a second, there we go. Okay, so I'll be presenting a case out of Thomas Jefferson. Um, this is an entirely percutaneous approach to an acute type B dissection with malperfusion. So the patient's a 35-year-old male. He had a history of chronic hypertension, CKD, very poorly controlled hypertension, who presented to an outside hospital with severe back pain and an MRI, which demonstrated a very significant type B dissection. Um, he had been intubated at the outside hospital, sent to the ICU for blood pressure control, and ultimately transferred to us at Thomas Jefferson for definitive care. Um, on arrival to us, he's intubated, sedated. Most significant findings on his exam were no femoral pulses bilaterally. They were not palpable and no signals. He also did not have any DP or PT Doppler signals on the right lower extremity, with just a monophasic signal on the left side. I included some lab values, which are highlighted in red, the significant ones, mostly his renal function, um, as well as a very elevated creatinine kinase. So here I will take you through his admission CTA. So when he came to us, we got a CTA to better delineate what was actually happening with his dissection. Um, so you'll see his dissection starts, it starts a little low, but it starts just distal to the left subclavian artery. It's a very small true lumen. You'll see as I travel down, um, there's a little lag, so bear with me, but it's a very small true lumen. Um, if I can find the celiac on the delay is killer. So at least, oh, I found the renal. So you'll see there is perfusion to the right kidney. Um, unfortunately, he did not have flow to his left kidney when we saw him. Um, his celiac and SMA both come off of the true lumen, but the true lumen is so small um, from that large false lumen that there's very diminished flow to those vessels. And then I'll take you down to his common iliac um, we actually lose it and you can see that the right common iliac is completely out and then it will reconstitute when we get to the common femoral on the right side. So then we pick it back up. So he was ultimately taken to the operating room there we go, um, for endovascular repair. So we gained access to his left groin initially through a five French sheath. We passed our glide wire and our glide cath up into the aortic arch where we shot an aortogram. Um, at that point, we deployed a cook covered stent graft just distal to the, to the left subclavian artery. Um, 
we continued down through the arch to extend with another covered stent graft up to the takeoff of the celiac artery. Once we were at the celiac artery and more distal within the aorta, um, we actually deployed two uncovered stent dissection um, grafts at that level. And we continued to stent all the way down. So we took those two uncovered stent grafts down to the bifurcation. We then turned our attention to the right lower extremity, which we knew from the CTA had nearly no flow through the common iliac artery on the right side. So we shoot a couple of arteriograms here. So we gained access to the right groin and then using a snare technique, we're able to bring our glide wire and our glide cap up and over to the right side and into the true lumen there. So once we took our pictures down the right side, we deployed a stent into the right common iliac artery and then also deployed two stents into the right external iliac artery. The reason we did that is after we had placed our first stent, there was still pretty poor flow through the distal aspect of our stent. So we placed two additional stents in the external iliac. And at that point, when we shot our completion angiogram, you could see that there's very good filling through the internal iliac artery. When we did our completion aortogram, we noticed that the flow to the right kidney after we stented was not very robust. So we then turned to an ICAST system and were able to pass a wire up into the right renal artery and ultimately deploy a stent into the right renal artery and have good flow to that right kidney at the conclusion of the case. Ultimately, the patient had a right lower extremity fasciotomy because of his prolonged time without uh, blood flow to the right foot and leg. He had that later closed and a split th thickness skin graft applied. He was actually discharged home on hospital day 30. A large part of his hospital stay was due to a pre-existing psychiatric history to get him very well connected um, for his care post this procedure. He also required dialysis briefly while he was in the hospital with us, but had his renal function return to baseline and did not require any dialysis once he was discharged. So this represents an entirely percutaneous approach to a pretty complicated acute type B e dissection with malperfusion to both the right kidney as well as the right lower extremity. Um, and this also highlights the ability to secondarily access the visceral vessels if it's needed for additional stenting, um, if there is malperfusion with this type B e dissection. I will take any questions. Uh, Dr. Lynch, very interesting case. A uh, technical question for you. Do you use IVUS uh, while, while deploying the, while deploying, uh, deploying the, the endographs? Uh, and how hard, how easy or how hard it was to channel into the true lumen and pass the, pass the device? So it was challenging to get into the true lumen, especially given how small it was. So we actually used TEE. Um, our anesthesia colleagues with some intraoperative TEE were able to help us identify and ensure that we were in the true lumen when we um, started the case before stenting anything. Amazing. Um, uh, excellent case and, and good outcome. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Uh, already. Uh, okay, hold on one second. We have some questions. Uh, questions. Uh, Dr. Lynch, uh, we have two questions for you. Number one from Dr. Chewy, uh, and it is that why use the second covered uh, aortic stent graft? Why not just use the dissection stents? So we used, we wanted to use a covered stent um, in the thoracic aorta. And then obviously once we got to the abdominal portion of the case, we used an uncovered stent to continue supply to our visceral vessels to not cover those. Okay, and the second question from Dr. Tranny is, any idea why he was so hypertensive at age 35? So I think part of it is some kind of underlying lying renal disease because he had pretty significant CKD already. Um, and also he's extremely non-compliant, um, a bit of a drug history. So I think there was concern at the outside hospital that there was potentially use of drugs and then just non-compliant with any of his medications. Got it. Uh, thank you once again for sharing the interesting case with me with us. Uh, the, uh, moving on to next presentation, that's uh, George. George, I'm going to goof up your last name, so I'm going to ask you to, to say it, uh, tell us about your last name. Um, uh, George uh, is our medical student, and he's going to be talking about a case report on arterial thoracic outlet syndrome. George? <laughs> 
Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Aziz. Uh, let's just make sure I have control of the slides. I believe I do. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. So again, my name is George Timhelakis, and Dr. Aziz, thank you again for the introduction. I'll be presenting a case of arterial thoracic outlet syndrome. Again, I have no conflicts to disclose. However, I just applied to O5 integrated vascular surgery residencies. Just throwing that out there. So we begin with a 58-year-old gentleman presenting to an outside hospital with three or four weeks of pain, numbness, weakness, and cold sensation in his left upper extremity. His uh, symptoms were episodic, but they were increasing in frequency. On exam, his motor function was intact. Uh, however, he did have uh, paresthesia at the fingertips, and he did have uh, good Doppler signals of his left radial and ulnar arteries. Here we can see some still images of the CT. What you can appreciate is that the subclavian artery, there seems to be a cervical rib that begins to overlie it and begins to compress it, uh, and as well as a subclavian aneurysm, artery aneurysm. On angiogram here, we see that there's also a brachial artery occlusion that actually decreases the flow to the radial and ulnar circulation. And so with that, this patient was then transferred to Jefferson for management of uh, arterial thoracic outlet syndrome and left upper extremity acute limb ischemia. For orientation purposes, this is the head up here and the shoulder here. Uh, the gentleman went, underwent a decompression of the thoracic outlet and using a paraclavicular approach as indicated here with the infraclavicular and supraclavicular uh, incisions. Now he also underwent anterior and middle scalenectomy. And what we can see here is the actual excision of the, um, or section rather, of the first uh, cervical, uh, the cervical rib and the first uh, rib as well. And as we move on here, we see that this is an actual uh, three centimeter subclavian artery aneurysm, and it's actually flayed open uh, with the clot still inside. And here we'll see the reconstruction of the subclavian artery. Uh, this is when we were actually sizing it with a seven millimeter PTFE. And then this was the distal anastomosis, which was already uh, created end to end. And then here we see the proximal anastomosis. We then moved on to the lazy S incision. And a cut down was made uh, to then access the brachial, ulnar, and radial uh, arteries. We then uh, basically uh, thrombic. Uh, performed thrombectomy uh, in these arteries, and we then also did um, TPA as well. On completion angiogram, we see that the circulation was restored. There was a little bit of still uh, weak circulation to the ulnar uh, system of the ulnar artery. However, uh, overall, he did have a much better uh, circulation overall. As far as his hospital course, uh, the first day he did not have any signals. Uh, this is post update zero. His fingers were pale and cold, and he did have mild paresthesia. However, as uh, we went on, uh, the first postoperative day, there was improvement of his hand ischemia, and we were able to get signals. And then on post operative day three, the patient was doing well, and uh, he was discharged home on aspirin and anticoagulation. At follow up at nine months, there was some residual left hand numbness. Uh, however, he, his hand was well perfused, had a good brachial pulse. Uh, there were still uh, no uh, left hand pulses but the uh, subclavian axillary bypass was patent. Now, and in conclusion, uh, as we just discussed, this was a case of arterial thoracic outlet syndrome. This is one of three types of thoracic outlet syndrome. There is neurogenic and venous. Neurogen neurogenic being one of the most common. And essentially, this, uh, the pathology of this uh, syndrome is essentially external compression of the subclavian artery, and this can then lead to stenosis and thrombosis uh, and aneurysm, as we saw in our patient. Uh, the issue lies when uh, clot will spew distally into the um, distal circulation and essentially cause acute limb ischemia from the embolism, and then uh, the patient will have exertional arm pain. I would just like to thank my mentors, Dr. Uh, Demuzio, Dr. Baba Kabai, and Dr. Salvatore, as well as Dr. Nurmead, and uh, the fellows as well that uh, helped me uh, so far at Jefferson. Thank you very much, and I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Uh, excellent case, uh, George. Thank you for sharing with us. I think a very nice case and very, uh, very um, good management and good outcomes. Thank you for sharing with us. I don't have any questions and I don't think uh, audience has any questions as well. So I think in the interest of uh, staying on time, we'll keep uh, on moving. Uh, our next Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Lily Sadri. Uh, 
uh, who will be presenting uh, on the topic of stage left vertebral artery transposition with thoracic endovascular aortic stent graft in the setting of aberrant vertebral artery. Dr. Sadri. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, my name is Lily Sadri, and I'm a fourth year resident at Abington um, Jefferson Health. And I'm trying to click, but it's lagging. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, our case involves a stage left vertebral artery transposition with a, a thoracic endovascular aortic stent graft in the setting of an aberrant vertebral artery. Um, we are going to discuss an eight centimeter descending thoracic aortic aneurysm um, with extension up until the level of the celiac artery with an aberrant left vertebral. Uh, our patient was a 70, oh, our patient was a 74 year old gentleman that presented to our outpatient office um, with an asymptomatic chest aneurysm. He had been followed at an outside hospital for this, but was lost to follow up after getting diagnosed many years ago. His past medical history is listed here and surgically he had, had, he had had extensive aortic surgery, including an ascending aortic arch repair, um, an aborted left internal carotid artery repair, resulting in a chronic total occlusion of that artery, and an open AAA repair. Um, this image reflects the uh, level of aneurysmal degeneration, which was present up until the level of the celiac artery. Uh, interestingly, pre-op imaging also showed that the patient had a left aberrant vertebral artery distal to his left subclavian. This arteriogram uh, is meant to represent our seal zone, which would include coverage of the left subclavian. And because of this, we uh, discussed with the patient that we would need to perform a stage procedure in which we would redirect um, blood flow initially from the aberrant vertebral um, and subclavian and then perform his T uh, T endovascular approach to repair his thoracic aneurysm. So on our first uh, operative day, we performed a left vertebral to proximal common carotid artery transposition. Um, we then performed a, on the same day, a distal common carotid to subclavian bypass with PTFE graft. Uh, and that evening, the patient had a lumbar drain uh, placed for spinal protection by neurosurgery. The next day, he underwent a T-bar with left subclavian coil embolization using a Cook thoracic alpha stent graft. Um, this imaging is uh, just meant to represent um, his anatomy. Kind of frozen, I'm sorry about that. Um, and as you see here, he has a ligated left vertebral artery from the prior day surgery. Um, this is a representation of our patent bypass, um, as well as the proximal portion of the thoracic stent graft. And distally, um, we have our uh, completion angiogram with the two stent grafts deployed um, without evidence of endo leak. Here we see our subclavian coils that we place via a left brachial artery approach. The patient well postoperatively um, and had no uh, deficits neurologically. Um, he followed up with us three months after his surgery um, and had imaging that showed a patent bypass um, and he still continues to have no neurologic deficits. So in conclusion, uh, we found that patients with a complex aortic surgical history require very careful preoperative planning for maintaining cer cerebral and spinal perfusion. Um, in the context of having aberrant anatomy, such as a replaced vertebral artery and a occluded left internal carotid artery, um, revascularization should be strongly considered. And um, our hybrid approach um, using a transposition with a carotid subclavian bypass and a T-bar um, was a successful um, outcome for our patient. Thank you um, to the society for allowing me to present today. I'll take any questions. Uh, Dr. Sadri, once again, a uh, nice case uh, uh, to share with us. A quick, uh, a quick technical question. So left common carotid artery had two bypasses, right? One hooked up to vertebral, one hooked up to left subclavian. Yes. Uh, just geometrically, how was it? How how did you position it? Was the vertebral bypass more cephalad, and 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 how much was the distance in between them? So um, the it, they were very close to each other, but the vertebral artery was proximal and distal to it. We performed our carotid to subclavian bypass, and then proximal to that transposition, the vertebral transposition, we did subclavian coil embolization. Sounds good.
uh, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we'll keep marching along. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Amrina Chima, who will be uh, talking to us on the topic of surgical treatment of thoracic aortic aneurysm in a patient with Lois Dietz syndrome. Dr. Chima. Dr. Chima, I think you're still muted. Yes, if you could start your video and unmute. Great. I'm sorry, I'm just having... Yes, you escaped out. Let me re-share re with you. Stand by. Okay, just go ahead and click on your title slide. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. You can click on your title slide. You should be able to take control. Yes. Um, there you go. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank the Society and Dr. Trani for giving me the opportunity to present this evening. Uh, my name is Amrina Chima. I will be presenting a case of thoracic aortic aneurysm in a patient with Lois Dietz syndrome. Our patient is a 60-year-old male who has a prior history of ascending aortic rupture back in 2007 for which he required a mechanical aortic valve replacement and aortic root replacement. He was then referred to us several years later in about 2017 for a finding of type B aortic dissection on his CAT scan. Um, we followed the patient for a period of time with serial CAT scan surveillance and he remained stable for some time and asymptomatic. However, uh, he eventually developed enlargement of the false lumen with encroachment into, into the true lumen in the thoracic aorta. Around this time, he also started reporting episode, episodes of recurrent chest pain. So this is his CAT scan prior to any intervention being pursued. And I will just direct our attention to the proximal uh, uh, descending aorta where here we can see the dissection flap. Um, it does uh, involve the origin of the left subclavian artery. Distally, the extent goes into the left common iliac artery. Um, and in the visceral segment, the, all the visceral vessels except the right renal artery arise from the true lumen and the right renal comes off of the false. Um, so that's kind of his anatomy. Uh, so we took the patient to the OR and did a left carotid to subclavian artery bypass and deployed an endograft. Um, uh, we used a Medtronic device um, and basically landed it in zone two. And then we did coil embolization of the proximal subclavian artery. He did okay postoperatively, but, but within a year, his CAT scan started showing further aortic degeneration. Notably, he had arterialized flow in the false lumen um, and the aneurysm sac was getting larger. Around this time, patient also started complaining of chronic right flank pain, which essentially would not resolve, um, you know, despite observation. Um, notably, around this time, the patient's daughter also became known to us as a patient with similar uh, aortic pathology at a very young age. So that finding prompted us to pursue a uh, genetic testing workup to see if there was some underlying connective tissue disorder within the family. So we referred the patient for testing and he was diagnosed with Lowy Steet syndrome at this time. Uh, we discussed with him that the definitive care for his condition will probably be an open thoracal abdominal repair and total aortic replacement. Um, however, the patient continued to refuse. So in an effort to help his right flank symptoms, which we believed might be due to malperfusion of the right kidney as, this, as the right renal artery comes off the false lumen, um, and to preserve his renal function you know, for future, because he would require multiple CAT scans down the line, we decided to perform a right external iliac artery to renal artery bypass. Uh, at the same time, we extended the endograft to just above the celiac artery and deployed, uh, not depicted in this image, but deployed additional coils into the uh, abdominal aortic false lumen. At the one month follow-up CAT scan, unfortunately, he again had aneurysm sac expansion now up to 6.5 centimeters. 
we took the patient to do a uh, diagnostic arch aortogram to better delineate his anatomy and kind of identify the cause of his sac expansion. And we noted that he had a type 1A endoleak. Um, so at this point, you know, again, it was discussed with him that he would need aortic replacement. Patient refused, but eventually became agreeable to having reconstruction of the ascending aorta and the, and the arch so that we could extend our endograph more proximally. Um, so if you recall, he had the prior uh, aortic root replacement. So a graft-to-graft -graft anastomosis was performed here to replace the arch. And then off of this uh, segment came off a bifurcated graft, which anastomosis to the innominate and the left common carotid arteries. Um, we were then able to extend the graft proximally into zone zero. Uh, and this actually allowed us to get resolution of the endoleak. Um, and I'll just show very quickly here. As you can see, this is the newly created bifurcated graft. These are the pre-existing subclavian artery coils. Um, there's a significant blush there prior to graft deployment and extension, um, and then following that finding is resolved. Here is the patient's one month follow-up CAT scan after the debranching and the graft, oh, I'm sorry, extension. Um, and I just wanted to kind of show um, the, the bypass graft as it comes off right there um, and then goes to the left common and denominate arteries. Um, there is no more flow into the false lumen in the thoracic aorta. And I did not include the last scan that he's had over the last uh, two months ago, but he actually now has positive aortic remodeling with um, increased diameter of his true lumen. So I think some of the points for discussion is that notably uh, surgical repair is pretty complex in patients who have underlying connective tissue disorders and up to 40% of patients with LDS eventually end up requiring a total aortic replacement after dissection. Um, and due to the, it's because of the high risk of progressive aortic dilatation and dissection in the landing zones that endovascular interventions are relatively contraindicated in these patients. I think a big take home for us was that in younger patients who don't have another, you know, uh, some of the common risk factors for developing aortic dissection, particularly, like I said, at a young age, um, the diagnosis of an underlying connective tissue disorder should be sought out and identified. And um, a, a key to that decision making is the family history and getting an idea of um, everyone else who may have similar uh, condition in the family. Thank you. I'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Chima, for excellent case presentation. You know, certainly a reminder uh, that you know um, some pathology is uh, is a gift which keeps on giving. Um, uh, but thank you so much uh, for present uh, for presenting this case. We do have a question. Uh, from Dr. Tarani, and the question is, how do you manage connective tissue disorder in patients who don't understand the consequences of refusing multiple surgeries? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the things in our situation was that we did not have the diagnosis when, when the first intervention was um, uh, offered to the patient. Um, you know, I think... I think it just has to be an early discussion from when you identify the problem that this is what you need as the definitive operation uh, for managing management of the pathology. And I think maybe the fact that we had offered him an endo option early on perhaps made him believe that that was um, a good option for him. And at the time it was, but now knowing what we know, um, he would have been better suited with an open repair. Um. Sounds good. Uh, thank you once again for, uh, for sharing the interesting case. Uh, we'll keep moving. Our next uh, case is a uh, presentation is by Dr. Michael Fadul, and he'll be talking about upper extremity thrombosis, secondary to retained axillary PTFE cuff after explant of prior XFEM bypass. Dr. Fadul. Thanks, Dr. Aziz. Uh, 
So I'm going to be talking about uh, upper extremity thrombosis, secondary to a retained axillary PTF, PTFE cuff. Uh, so this is a 63-year-old gentleman who was transferred to our institution with exposed infected uh, right femoral prosthetic, had a history of PAD and underwent a right axillary profunda bypass with jump grafting to the popliteal artery for critical limb ischemia after failed femoral crossover grafting. So his past medical history is notable for diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease, as well as COPD. Uh, his past vascular surgery history is notable for an initial left to right fem fem bypass graft. Uh, four months later, he returned with a right femoral infection requiring initial graft explantation, flat placement, and a new axillary profunda graft, as well as a jump graft to the popliteal artery. Uh, this served him well for four years until ultimately his right leg met an untimely demise and underwent an above knee amputation outside institution. So following his right above knee amputation, he was transferred back to this institution for management of a right femoral herald bleed and infected prosthetic pictured on the first slide. Uh, upon admission, he was febrile, found to have leukocytosis, uh, was started on a course of antibiotics, and shortly thereafter was taken to the OR for explantation of the infected prosthetic. Uh, approximately, he had a uh, well-incorporated uh, graft that we left a small cuff on the axillary artery uh, distally, all the prosthetic was able to be explanted. Uh, cultures from the graft were positive for Klebsiella and Proteus, and antibiotic therapy was tailored appropriately. So the patient represented one month later with right upper extremity acute limb ischemia. He underwent an open thrombectomy of the brachial, radial, and ulnar arteries, and afterwards uh, underwent appropriate evaluation for an embolic source. Uh, the CT here shows the axillary stump with flow, uh, some residual flow into that stump. Uh, an echocardiogram didn't identify any cardiac thrombus. He had arrhythmias during his hospitalization and was discharged on Sorelto. So he presented to an outside institution uh, one month later with the subsequent episode of right arm acute limb ischemia. There he underwent a repeat thrombectomy with exclusion of the axillary cuff with the Vibon stent graft. Uh, he was con continued on his Zarelto, and one month after the second event, he was transferred back to our institution for evaluation of worsening ischemic changes in the right hand. Uh, it eventually progressed to gangrenous changes and ultimately required a transradial amputation. So this path uh, pathology that this patient suffered was classified under uh, the sparsely reported axillary femoral stump syndrome. Uh, and so there's pretty little uh, literature regarding this. And so the management ranges anywhere from open to endovascular surgery. Uh, the only thing that had in common with our presentation was those who were managed conservatively after the initial resection or initial thrombectomy with anticoagulation ultimately ended up having a recurrent event uh, requiring a definitive repair. And I'll take questions. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, certainly an interesting case. Um, uh, thank you for presenting it. Uh, we, we have seen this case, you know, it's definitely after axillary vein, actually artery uh, conduit sewn by cardiac surgery services and ligating them afterwards. Uh, but after explant of XFEM bypass, you know, it's a short stump. So it's, uh, it's a unique case that, you know, even with that short of a stump, it was able to not only form a clot, but distally uh, embolize it. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your case. We'll move on to the next, uh, to the last presentation for tonight by Dr. Uh, 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 Lauren uh, Jonas. I, I'm sorry, she's a medical student, and her uh, the topic of her presentation is progressive aneurysmal disease in Magic Syndrome. Lauren, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Lauren Jonas. I'm a medical student at Cooper University Hospital. Thank you on behalf of my colleagues and myself for the opportunity to present a case of progressive aneurysmal disease in a patient with MAGIC syndrome. Tonight, we'll specifically focus on the management of this patient's recurrent femoral aneurysms requiring endovascular salvage following a rapidly degenerating prior open repair. Uh, 
All right, so our patient is a 57 year old male. He has a past medical history of magic syndrome for which he's on high, high dose daily prednisone. In addition, past medical history is notable for insulin dependent diabetes, bladder cancer, avascular necrosis of the right hip secondary to his chronic steroid use, and extensive aneurysmal disease involving the thoracic aorta through the femoral arteries for which he underwent multiple endovascular repairs at an outside institution in 2014, 15, as well as 16. These endograft repairs um, treated his infrarenal and bilateral common and external iliac artery aneurysms with coil embolization of both internal iliac arteries. He subsequently developed more proximal aneurysmal aortic disease and loss of the proximal seal um, of that prior repair. So he underwent a four vessel branched endograft in 2018. His past social history is notable for prior tobacco use with cessation one year ago, prior. So in 2019, the patient presented as a transfer to Cooper Hospital for an enlarging common femoral artery aneurysm and worsening left femoral pain. CT imaging demonstrated a left common femoral artery pseudoaneurysm measuring 5.7 by 4.9 centimeters, enlarged from 3.2 by 2.7 centimeters two months previously. The right common femoral artery had a pseudoaneurysm of 4.2 by 3.6 centimeters, which was also enlarged. The patient was taken to the OR for open exposure of the left superficial femoral artery, uh, retrograde vibe on stent placement and plication of the pseudoaneurysm sac. 10 days later, he represented with symptomatic right common femoral artery aneurysm with acute groin pain um, that extended to his foot. And at that time, an open repair was performed using a bovine, a bovine carotid interposition graft from the common femoral artery to the superficial femoral artery with re-implantation of the profunda into the side of the bypass, followed by placement of a sartorius flap. An interposition graft was used as the aneurysm was noted to affect the bifurcation of the SFA and PFA, and the bifurcation was otherwise unable to be preserved. The patient represented 10 days later um, following the right femoral repair with complaints of pain and erythema in the incision site. The incision was actually opened and a wound vac was placed. Cultures were positive for Pseudomonas and Enterobacter cloacae, and the patient completed a course of antibiotics per infectious disease. 11 months later, the patient represented again with worsening right groin pain. CT angiogram showed degeneration of that prior repair. Intra-op angiography revealed two areas of aneurysmal degeneration, one proximally on the common femoral artery and one distally involving the bifurcation and ostea of the profunda femoris and the superficial femoral artery. The profunda femoris was coil embolized to prevent back bleeding and a bibund stent was placed in the distal common femoral artery and extended into the proximal SFA. These two reconstructions show the branched visceral endograft as well as the bilateral femoral pseudoaneurysms. On the right, the pseudoaneurysm affects that um, bifurcation of the PFA and uh, SFA, and on the left, it arises anteriorly from the middle of the common femoral artery. These images show um, the degenerated bovine carotid interposition graft. Um, over here and the re-implanted profunda femoris artery, and then the post-embolization endograft image is on the right side here. MAGIC syndrome, it stands for mouth and genital ulcer inflamed with inflamed cartilage. It's an extremely rare autoimmune condition that contains features of both Bechet's disease and relapsing polychondritis, such as systemic vasculitis and aneurysmal degeneration of large arteries. In patients with Bechet's disease, aneurysms are present in about 10 to 15% of cases, mostly in the abdominal aorta. And in relapsing polychondritis, aneurysms are present in about 5 to 7% of cases, mostly in the ascending aorta. And not surprisingly, this presents a high risk of morbidity and mortality. Um, management of MAGIC syndrome consists of corticosteroids, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, cyclosporine A, interferon alpha, anti-TNF alpha agents, all to reduce, um, sorry, to induce remission. And of course, coordination with rheumatology in order to optimize care 
and timing of intervening is imperative to ensure the best outcomes for these patients. I will be happy to answer any questions at this time. Um, no, thank you so much for uh, sharing your uh, certainly challenging and interesting case with us. Uh, certainly unique. Thank you so much. So I think for that, we are at the end of our uh, presentations. I'd like to thank you all presenters uh, for sharing your uh, nice cases with us. It is now time for to vote for, uh, to, for your top two highest rated papers for the evening. Um, uh, we'll start the vote now, um, which reminds me that I should start polling, uh, voting myself as well. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll wait for a few minutes till we get the, uh, the voting results back. So let me vote as well. And the votes are coming in. Dr. Aziz, I will send you a uh, chat message when I have the results. Sounds good. Uh, I think regardless of whoever wins the competition, I think the overall quality was very, was very good. Um, you know, especially encouraging to see residents and students uh, presenting their, their nice cases. Um, uh, interesting management uh, and certainly interesting dilemmas that we as Vasco students come across in our daily lives. It looks like the votes have settled and we do have Someone in the lead, I will send you the chat message now. Alrighty, so the winner for tonight is Dr. Lily Sadri. Congratulations. Dr. Sadri, are you still here? Yes, I'm here. Very well, congratulations uh, for winning the award. A very nice presentation. Um, Good job. Thank you very much. All righty. So in the closing, I think overall, everybody did a great job. Thank you so much. I do have a message from our president, Dr. Jose Trani. Um, uh, first of all, on behalf of, DV, uh, of Delaware Valley Vasco Society, we're very thankful to our sponsors uh, for, for all their help for, for our societies, um, uh, for our society. Uh, the sponsors for this year are Gore, Boston, and Medtronic. Uh, also, please mark your calendars uh, for the spring meeting, which is on uh, April 29th at the Union League. Uh, we certainly hope that uh, to meet everybody in person there next year. On that note, thank you so much and have a good night, everybody.